they have never left the virgin forest. They live in the heart of Africa. Their god is the jungle itself which protects them. They are living proof of our own prehistory. But even they have reached the end of the world. Powerless, they consider the possibility that their green god may fall victim to the logging industry. They do not understand there's nothing they can do. They are now a people with no future. There are still indigenous groups that have not been reached or which choose to remain isolated. In the Amazon basin, there are as many as a hundred tribes of this kind. In Oceania, there are just a few isolated tribes in Papua New Guinea and in Irian Jaya. Sentinels from the Andaman Islands are the only people on the Asian continent to be cut off from civilization. In Central Africa, there are still groups of pygmies whose existence is closely linked to their rainforest. They all look at the oil companies, the loggers, and miners of gold and other natural resources as ghosts of the dead. Their arrival means the end of their habitat. These are the original inhabitants of Central Africa. All pygmy groups are supposedly descended from a common tribe, perhaps the oldest in the history of mankind. They have lived here for many thousands of years, under the jungle canopy they worship as their creator god. Of the 500,000 pygmies in Africa, only about 5,000 still live in the rainforest interior. Most have abandoned this natural home and now live a rootless existence in the slums near large cities or at the edges of dry and dusty trails. There are countries like Cameroon where the government has ordered that the pygmies leave the jungle. This eliminates the awkward possibility of witnesses to the stripping away of natural resources. The expanding desert and increasing deforestation are doing away with the forests of Central Africa. Since the last decade of the 20th century, Africa has suffered the world's highest percentage of rainforest destruction. Every year, 10 million cubic meters of wood is removed. The pygmies watch the destruction of their habitat, unable to do anything. The fierce and indiscriminate logging shrinks their world a bit more with each passing day. They don't understand why the white man is destroying their forest, killing their god. More than half of Africa's equatorial forests have already disappeared for good. In the past, logging permits were given in areas where there were wide swaths of the same type of tree, which contained the impact of the activity. But now, there is no sort of legal impediment to the logging. To remove one single tree, the destruction is unthinkable. Machines wipe out all vegetation as they move toward the felled tree. They wipe away all hope for the rainforest's recovery. This is the agony of the pygmy's green god, the death of the Earth's second lung, thanks to utter indifference regarding the corruption found in the governments of Africa. Still, deep within the forest, life continues to make a powerful showing. It may be fragile, but this is the perfect ecosystem, constantly evolving. The cycles of life and death march on ceaselessly. Death feeds new life in a process that cannot be stopped. Soil in the rainforest is not fertile, which explains why trees do not grow in the place of others that have been cut down. Plant remains cover the ground in a continual state of decomposition, the essential humus that feeds the life cycle of the entire ecosystem.
Defined as a green hell by the first Western explorers in the 19th century, this is a veritable paradise for the pygmies, who are perfectly adapted to this place. Here in this world, so hostile to us, they are able to obtain everything they need. They are perfectly familiar with the botany of the jungle. Every plant, every root, every type of bark has a specific use. Nearly everything they have, they've gotten from the forest. They know the processes that plant products must be submitted to in order to produce the different tools that make their lives possible. Ropes of different thicknesses and strengths, fishing traps, hunting nets, sleeping mats, baskets, necklaces, bracelets, armbands and beads, benches for sitting on, shelters and houses, weapons, harnesses for climbing trees, bridges made of vines, even their clothing is made of plant fibers. Pygmy groups dress differently depending on their region. From the traditional loincloth of the Banbuti in the jungles of Ituri in the Congo, to the grass skirts of the Baka in Cameroon and the Central African Republic. Those items they are unable to make are obtained through trade with nearby tribes. Occasionally, they leave the jungle and approach Bantu villages to trade skins and meat from the forest for machetes, knives, aluminum pots, hunting bows, and cloth. The pygmies are a singing people. Almost everything they do is accompanied by song. This is clear evidence that they can be defined as happy. Their voices call out in a sort of yodel, similar to the tradition Tyrolean call. The songs have no set lyrics, but are rather improvised with quick high to low changes in tone, creating a melodious polyphony. Every woman takes a burning stick from her family's hearth. Fire is an element of utmost importance for the pygmies. They know how to make it, but they prefer to preserve it. They're ready to begin the march. A nomadic people, every so often they abandon their settlements and move to another area. The women use baskets to transport their few worldly goods. A few kitchenwares, some cloth, the machete, and some sort of knife. The men carry spears, hunting nets, and crossbows. They leave their camps when hunting becomes scarce or when they are attacked by big cats. They may also move on when there are not enough mangongo leaves to make the roofs of their houses. When they wander, they do so within a diameter of fewer than 50 kilometers, and they always walk to the sound of their own singing.
They usually settle in places where they have been before, always on the banks of a river. Women are in charge of building the huts. First, they clear the land, cut flexible branches, and gather mangongo leaves. The huts are semicircular in shape. The structure is built by weaving together flexible branches in the shape of a dome. Occasionally, tree trunks are used to hold them up, making them stronger. Called mangulus, each hut is a sort of plant igloo. It may well be the simplest dwelling made by man since the beginning of time. The shape of the settlement depends on the terrain. It might be circular, elongated, or rectangular. The doors of the mongulus and shelters are always oriented toward the center of the encampment where the communal hearth is located. The leaves of the mangongo act as roof tiles to waterproof the dwelling. Using their teeth, the pygmies detach the leaf's central stem, which will serve as an anchor in the framework of branches. They start at the bottom and work up, so that the water will run down and not penetrate the roof. <laughs> The covering won't last more than a month. When the leaves dry, they must be replaced to ensure that they remain waterproof. The pygmies sleep around a central fire, which in addition to keeping them warm, keeps the mosquitoes at bay. A variety of pygmy groups can be found in Cameroon, Gabon, the Central African Republic, Uganda, Rwanda, and the two republics of the Congo. The silence of these forests was broken by the madness of a royal psychopath in one of the most horrific genocides in modern history. In the late 1800s, the bloody claws of King Leopold II of Belgium had their merciless way with the entire population of the Congo. It is thought that more than 10 million people died in a period of 23 years. There was a systematic and indiscriminate exploitation of natural resources, including rubber and ivory, for which indigenous labor was used exclusively in conditions of extreme slavery. Mass slaughter was not uncommon nor was the burning of villages or punishment by example in the form of torture or the mutilation of hands and legs. The genocide under Leopold II was quite possibly the worst in history. The pygmies, who by nature are docile, social, and not at all aggressive, were forced to defend themselves. They formed large groups to combat the slave trafficking brigades of the Belgian king. They were so well adapted to their environment that their capture was quite difficult. In fact, the proportion of pygmies captured with respect to Bantus was quite small. Slave hunters had a hard time moving through the tangled thickets of the rainforest. The pygmies were difficult to find, seemingly able to make themselves invisible. They moved quickly over terrain that was full of obstacles for the slave traffickers. In this sinister era, the American Samuel Phillips Verner bought nine pygmies from a group of slave traders and brought them to the World's Fair in St. Louis. This marked the beginning of the story of Otabenga, who was sent to the Bronx Zoo when the expo ended and exhibited in the monkey house with an orangutan. In response to the outcry of churchgoers and moralists, Otabenga was freed. But several years later, he took his own life with a revolver. Knowing he would never return to Africa, was more than he could bear. Today, other threats loom in the land of the pygmies. Virgin forests are disappearing due to the overexploitation of their resources. Pygmies have always been respectful of nature. They are hunter-gatherers who would never take down an animal they don't intend to eat. 
This is the law of the jungle. If you respect life, the great spirit of the forest will protect you. They make their own hunting weapons, hatchets, spears, knives, and bows. Their spearheads are made with the metal from used machetes, which they trade for with their Bantu neighbors. When metal is unavailable, they use the sharpened points of antelope antlers, especially that of the diker. In the Congo, the Mbuti pygmies use bows and arrows, while in the Central African Republic and Cameroon, the Bakai use crossbows. These weapons are highly precise. Among the Baka, much of the work is carried out in groups, especially those chores related to hunting, like making crossbow darts. They chip the wood into small pieces, which are then sharpened and straightened. On the end, instead of feathers, they attach a leaf cut into a triangular shape, which helps to stabilize the dart. Finally, they dip the dart tip in a mixture of mud and a potent venom derived from a plant, which will poison their prey. Before the hunt begins, early in the morning, the women of the camp come together to sing the yelly. This song starts with a single voice, and the others slowly join in, one by one. They believe the melody of the yelly charms the animals, making them easier to hunt down. An older woman uses a magic oil to anoint the arms and foreheads of the hunters, protecting them from the ferocious animals and dangers of the jungle. Later, she and the head of the hunting party cut a leaf in half. One part will stay in the camp as a symbol of the party's return. They are excellent trackers. By observing droppings and the vegetation that is broken and damaged by animal movement or grazing, the hunters know the species of animal they are likely to find nearby. They also know its age, its sex, its size, and the place it is likely to be found at a given moment. Bays, clearings in the jungle which are a product of the Earth's salinity, are places where animals gather early in the morning and at dusk. Many have pools and small lakes, making them natural watering holes. Although the main reason for this concentration of mammals is to feed on the grasses that grow in this area where the salt content is high. The most frequently hunted animals include diker, antelope, wild boar, all kinds of birds, monkey, buffalo, and elephant. The baka are very respectful of the gorilla, which they consider a totemic animal. They are the messengers of the green god. As they tell it, they receive messages from the great beyond, which are delivered to them in their dreams by gorillas. Like elephants, forest buffaloes are smaller than their savanna-dwelling cousins, but they are just as dangerous when attacked. 
On special occasions, the pygmies organize a hunt of these great mammals. The elephant hunt is the most dangerous of all. They stalk the animal from downwind, so their scent does not give them away. When they get close enough, they show their bravest colors, moving in for the kill. They use short spears to stab the pachyderm in the belly, then rip the skin with a firm tug. They do this over and over until the skin is so weak and damaged that the mortally wounded elephant begins to flee. The hunters follow the elephant sometimes for days until its intestines are hanging out and it can't go on. These hunting outings usually end the life of several hunters as well. The number of elephants that can be hunted in this way is minuscule when compared to those brought down by ivory poachers, who are causing the populations of these enormous mammals to decline drastically. The Baka people can imitate the sound of almost all the animals they hunt, like this call that mimics the cry of a wounded diker. The poison dart quickly takes the life of these small antelopes. They seem to be made for jungle life. Their short stature, 1.35 meters for women and 1.45 meters for men on average, allows them to move easily through the forest undergrowth. Their bodies are strong, lean, and well-proportioned. They are completely adapted to their environment. The hunting parties meet in the bay before heading back to camp. Their polyphonic sounds mean that the hunt has been a success. There will be food for everyone. The meat is divided among all of the families in the village. It is the women who receive it from the hands of the hunters themselves, though this is not the case in every group. It only happens among hunters who use nets. The type of hunt in which the entire village participates makes these communities even more tightly knit. Among the large Akka group, hunting with nets is quite common. Except for the oldest and youngest members, everyone participates. The more, the better. Once they reach the chosen area, the men arrange the nets. One after the other, they make sure there are no gaps forming an open semicircle that reaches some 600 meters. The two ends are tied to trees or strong plants, and the nets are drawn taut in the undergrowth at just over one meter off the ground. The baka, especially the women, usually decorate their bodies and faces with tattoos and ritual scarring using clan symbols. Sometimes these cuts are considered magical or therapeutic in nature, the incisions are made using a knife dipped in palm oil, which aids in the scarring process. When the chief of the hunt gives the sign, the others begin to shake branches and scream to scare the prey from the entrance to the semicircle into the nets. Those lying in wait kill the animals as they come toward them, using spears, machetes, and hatchets. A 
Another important source of protein can be found in the rivers. Fishing is women's work, but also requires the participation of the entire community. They fish during the dry season, when the small rivers run much lower. Using mud and branches, they build a dam that cuts off the river's flow. Later, they make smaller dams to form places where the water collects. With their hands or the help of large leaves or pots, they drain the pools. They pass the water from one dam to the next until the riverbed is completely dry. Now it's easy to catch the fish with their hands. Some of the men accompany the women to the river. Their job is to protect them from dangerous animals, but they do not fish. They don't use hooks or nets. In spite of the numerous rivers in pygmy territory, they have never been known to build canoes or any other kind of boat. The largest fish can be found in the caves along the riverbanks, although most of the fish in these streams are quite small. The pygmies also collect crabs and eels. These streams are quite dangerous. There are sometimes run-ins with less pleasant animals, like snakes. This is home to two of the world's most dangerous snakes, considered so for their highly toxic venom. The Gaboon Snake Eater, a serpent known as Four Steps, a reference to the final steps taken by its victims before dying. And the Black Mamba, also known as Minute, the time it takes for victims to fall after being bitten by its poisoned fangs. Before leaving the river, the women clean the fish. In this hot climate, where the humidity can reach 100%, the fish will rot quickly if they are not gutted right away. At the end of the day, especially if their catch is abundant, the women play the river like a musical instrument. They beat the surface of the water with their hands and arms, making a drumming sound. They dance and sing to the rhythm of this water percussion. Their voices join together in a polyphonic harmony that can be heard from far away under the jungle's great dome of vegetation. As we observe their villages, it seems that we are observing our own prehistory, traveling back in time to the Neolithic age. The lifestyle of our Western ancestors wouldn't have been very different from the way these jungle pygmies live, maintaining an ancestral way of life rooted to the land. And there is no doubt that this land belongs to them. They were here before the colonial powers arrived before Africa was divided up between European governments, before there were independent African nations. But the reality is that no one recognizes their age-old hold on this land. Activity in the village begins at sunup. Personal hygiene, cleaning up the camp, which is very important for controlling insect levels, collecting firewood, preparing meals.
The removal of external parasites is extremely important. One by one, they take turns picking off lice and other uncomfortable bugs that burrow into their heads and skin. The first testimony to the existence of these people can be traced to an Egyptian document from the ancient kingdom, in which Pharaoh Pheops II instructs Harkuf, head of an expedition toward the south, to bring a small Akkadancer back to the court. To the west of the Mountains of the Moon, they found a settlement of tree dwarfs, who sang and danced as they worshipped their god. Thus, the first denomination of these pygmies was the Dancers of God. The next bit of information comes from Herodotus, who as he spoke of the battle fought by the small men against the cranes, called them pygmies, the Greek word for fist. According to him, these diminutive hunters did not measure more than one fist, a Greek measurement that was about the same as the distance between a grown man's elbow and his knuckles. Pygmies are monogamous, although polygamy is permitted. The man pays a dowry to his wife's family. The exchange of sisters is also quite common. They don't have many children, as is the case with the neighboring Bantu people. Great attention is paid to babies. Starting at about seven or eight years old, when they are circumcised, the responsibility for their education falls to the community. It is the elders who are in charge of teaching them, and of the successive initiation rites they will have to undergo before they can be considered adults ready for the rite of marriage. Although one of their favorite pastimes is playing in the river from the time they are quite small, almost none of them knows how to swim. Nearly all of them smoke, especially the older ones. Sometimes they acquire tobacco through trade with the Bantus, but usually they gather the leaves of wild tobacco plants themselves. Before they can smoke them, they dry the leaves near the fire. When they are almost ready, they crumble them up in the palm of their hand and make a rudimentary cigarette with a green leaf. <coughs> in certain ceremonies and dances, they smoke banga, a kind of wild cannabis. Of all the food the pygmies gather in the rainforest, there is no doubt that the most highly valued is honey. Honey gatherers are highly respected for their bravery, as this activity puts their lives at risk. They believe that honey is a gift from the god of the jungle, a powerful medicine that gives them strength and alleviates fatigue. Once they have located a beehive, they light a fire and weave a large basket on site. This is the container they will catch the honey in. They wrap burning logs with green twigs and leaves, creating bundles that produce huge quantities of smoke. Smoke is the only thing that will protect them from bee stings when they invade the honeycomb. And these are always located in the highest reaches of the treetops. With the smoking bundles hung on their backs, they begin the dangerous ascent. They climb up using the parasitic vines that hang from the tree's canopy. The honeycomb can be found as much as 30 meters high.
The honey gatherers hold a small protection ceremony before leaving camp. Their work is related to their religious beliefs. They must ask for permission from the great spirit of the forest before they can extract the precious nectar. If they don't, they are sure to die. The first to try the honey are the sick, who usually wait at the foot of the tree where they can ingest it as soon as possible. The pygmies are familiar with many types of bees and kinds of honey. The most highly valued is one called ground honey. It is produced by small, inoffensive bees who build their hives underground. The pygmies dig a hole, careful not to break the honeycomb, which is normally found at a depth of about 50 centimeters. The honey is very dark and somewhat sour. They believe in transcendence. After they die, they travel to the past where they reunite with the spirits of their ancestors. When the death is accidental, as was the case with this hunter, the impact on the community is greater than it is when the person has died of natural causes. They believe that the deceased must have committed some sort of taboo or hunted more than he could eat. And for this reason, the forest god left him unprotected. The funeral dances begin at night. Depending on the importance of the deceased, these can go on for several days. Members of the deceased's family paint their faces with china clay in an act of mourning. The entire village participates in these funerals, and people even come from far off encampments. They must give the deceased an acceptable send off so his spirit will rest in peace. If not, it may remain among the living and cause problems. Together with the family, it's the Council of Elders that decides how long the celebration must go on. They also indicate which dances and songs must be performed and when. Women and men dance on and on throughout the night. From time to time, someone describes a quality of the deceased or expresses how much they loved him, while the others shout out encouragement and applaud. They must show the spirit of the deceased how much they miss him. After circumcision, the next step in the initiation of younger members is teeth sharpening. They must show that they are brave, able to withstand pain. They mustn't let their suffering show. Both women and men are subjected to this trial. In addition to being an initiation rite, they also do it for practical reasons. Game meat is quite tough, and this makes it easier for them to chew. There are also aesthetic reasons which are difficult for us to understand.
The officiant files the upper incisors with a knife under the watchful eye of those who have gathered to observe the young boy's reaction. The process is slow and careful, so as not to damage the root of the tooth. One step down from the great forest god are the natural and ancestral spirits. The Ngangan, or shaman, has the power to invoke them and ask for their help, whether it be for healing, or as we see here, to consult them about a decision that must be made. After the invocation on the riverbank, they go to the village fire and place bundles of branches on the hot coals. Together with the elders who accompany him, the Ngangan carefully observes how the branches twist and fade in the heat. In this way, he interprets the message from the great beyond. For pygmies, the jungle is full of symbols and messages from the spirits. They interpret everything that happens. The way the vines that fall from above are intertwined, the sunbeams that filter down through the thick branches, the movement of the fog as it moves up the mountainside, the cry of an animal, the spirits speak to them constantly. the spirits of nature leave the forest and meet up with them. This green mask is the representation of a being from the underworld who dances with them to the sound of the drum and flute. For Westerners, this is nothing more than a man camouflaged with a bunch of branches. But things are different in Africa. Power and magic are never questioned. Only the initiates close to him know who is under the mask. But even they believe that once he enters the trance, the man leaves his human essence behind and becomes another inhabitant of the great beyond. Now he is a spirit who must be respected and revered so that he will bestow them with his blessing. Trying to see who is dancing beneath the mask or any other breach of respect could mean sickness and disgrace. The Ngangan are well versed in the huge pharmacy which is the jungle. They prepare any number of medicines using leaves, flowers, roots, bark, vines, mushrooms, animals and minerals. They are unaware of the active healing ingredients, but with the essential help from the spirits they invoke, they are able to cure and protect others from spells and witchcraft, the main cause of illness. They have remedies for almost all the maladies they see. In the surrounding Bantu tribes, they are highly respected as healers. It's no wonder pygmies are one of the longest-lived peoples on the planet.
By using Nbundun, they travel with their senses to the underworld. These are iboga roots. Its bark contains a hallucinogenic alkaloid called ibogaine, an antheogen drug similar to peyote, ayahuasca, and the Amanita muscaria family. Its ingestion brings on an altered state of consciousness, which allows one to see afar, as they say. They are carried away to another reality, to a world which is parallel to that of the living, where they receive messages from their god. They choose a group of strong men to take the aboga and go on the psychedelic journey. determines the dose they must take to reach the raptured state without hurting themselves. Ibogain is an extremely potent cardiac drug. An overdose could cause irreversible damage and even death. The rhythm of the drums and song help the chosen to enter into the state of hypnotic trance which is necessary for traveling to the other world. The elders are with them at all times, anointing them with oils that will protect them from the evil spirits who will attempt to harm them. The visionary drug has taken effect. Now their bodies will slowly become paralyzed, and their spirits will struggle to leave the material world behind. Soon, the journey will begin. A pronounced loss of balance makes it necessary for them to lie face down, the only position in which they can bear the dizziness they feel. They try to keep their muscles and joints from becoming numb. A medicine made of leaves is applied behind their ears, which has the power to bind them to the earth, ensuring their return. Their faces are painted with clan symbols so that the spirits can identify them as members of the correct tribe. For hours, everyone remains silent, observing and taking care of them. Hallucinogenic effects fade, they are brought to. Everyone waits for them to recover, eager to hear the message they have received. The body slowly regains its strength. The elders tend to them until they have completely returned to reality. They are cold. The heat of the fire helps them to recover as they consider how to describe what they have witnessed in the great beyond. When the moment comes, they speak of what they have seen. The elders interpret their words and relay the message to the rest of the community. If the message is positive, the women dance in praise of their green god. The inquiry is over. This is how the men of the African jungle have lived from the beginning of all time. In this green universe, which they have never left, no one knows how much time remains for them, but there is still hope. We mustn't allow their world to be wiped out. <laughs> 